We have got a ton to cover today, as you can well imagine. Lots of things happening all day today. Plenty to report on. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, Larry Goldberg with me today. We've kind of figured out later in the week, we think we can get him on here on Friday and on Saturday. So we'll see if that all works out. But it's really been hard trying to connect that. Also, tomorrow morning, a programming note, there will not, the show tomorrow morning will not be at uh, 710 as it usually is, probably at least an hour later. Uh, well, after certain, sometime after eight o'clock California time tomorrow morning will be after the bell because why? Because I'll be over there on that X uh, uh, the uh, with the uh, Trueflation folks. They are putting on a uh, spaces on X, and I will be participating in that as their featured guest. Yes. Anyway, let's see. We'll start with the. Let's start where we start. Let's start with Dan Ives. Dan, Dan Ives is Dives Tech. If you don't follow him yet on X, Tesla is reportedly cutting more than 10% of its global staff of 140,000, including Baglino, which is a gut punch and a key executive. Now, that's assuming that Baglino is being cut as part of that 10% uh, layoff. I don't think that's exactly the right thing, although it might not have been coincidental that it happened today. We also know that it includes... Uh, uh, Rohan as well. So the street wants and needs, this is this is back to uh, what Dan Ives is saying, the street wants and needs, all caps, answers on Tesla's first quarter conference call next Tuesday, as the string of bad news over the last few months has been a horror show for investors. Now, I can see and I, I understand why some people are calling this Black Monday for Tesla, but on a day when the NASDAQ was down 1.79, when ARC, Block, and Square were all down the same percentage Tesla, and when 10-year yields were up 11 basis points on, on the day, gold was up a full percent, while another full percent. And while the world waits for Israel's response to Iran and the S&P is down 4% from all-time highs and the Dow is down even more than that, uh, you know, it wasn't that bad a day in terms of the stock response to what happened at Tesla. Yes, Drew and Rohan leaving is not good. I can't make it good. I can't come up with a positive spin on those two guys leaving. A 10% layoff? Yeah, it's probably good. It almost always causes stocks to go up when companies lay off that are, that are you know, in good shape and Tesla's in good shape. Will they earn less than they did last quarter? Maybe, probably. Um, but they got $30 billion in the bank and uh, they're earning money and they're throwing off free cash flow and their prospects are outstanding. Um, so a 10% layoff is a good thing. It shows that management is paying attention. And it, as, uh, as uh, Econometrix 1 says over on X, he says, Elon cuts before he has to. Others cut after it's too late. Case in point, Rivian. <laughs> so you've heard me talk about this already, probably this morning if you watched After the Bell. You need to cut. A lot of companies just do it so automatically, 10% a year. So anyway, let's talk about the Gen 3 consumer vehicles. This is from Electrek. Electrek, you know, has a kind of a negative attitude right now about all things Tesla and Elon. So take that into consideration as I go through this. So Electric can confirm that Tesla indeed put its upcoming $25,000 electric car, sometimes referred to as the Model 2 by people that are not paying attention, on the back burner despite what Elon Musk said. The project was codenamed NV9. Tesla has been working on its next generation vehicle platform that is expected to enable much cheaper electric vehicles. The automaker has previously talked about two upcoming vehicles on the platform, a model cheaper and smaller than Model 3, sometimes referred to as the 25,000 Tesla, and the Tesla Robotaxi, a new vehicle designed from the ground up for self-driving without a steering wheel and et cetera, et cetera. You get it. A few weeks ago, Reuters reported that Tesla had canceled the long-promised inexpensive car, which CEO Elon Musk quickly denied and said they were lying. As usual, there's more to the story, says uh, Electric. It's likely that Musk's blanket denial of the report is due to Reuters claiming that the vehicle was scrapped and canceled. Electric can confirm that the program, which was internally called MD9, was postponed, according to sources familiar with the matter. Musk might take issue with the claiming that it was canceled, but the pro project is effectively scratched right now as Tesla is putting all resources into its self-driving effort. We'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute from my perspective. According to sources familiar with the matter, Musk told his Tesla team in Austin in December, in December, 
and this is the first time it's sneaking up, that NV9 and expansion of and expansion of the Gigafactory Texas for the new cheaper next gen model was a priority for 2024. However, the project was recently completed, completely defunded, and many people involved in it were laid off as part of a round of layoffs announced today. Instead, Musk said he wanted Tesla to focus on the South expansion of the Gigatex, Gigafactory Texas, which is going to house a giant data center for the Robo Taxi project. According to people familiar with the project, it is also behind schedule, and there is serious doubt that it could be completed by the end of August, meaning the new, uh, the new Robo Taxis which is the timeline Musk had been pushing for. Shortly after denying the report that the cheaper model was canceled, Musk announced that Tesla would unveil his robotaxi on August 8th. Electric's take. Electrex take. I guess I don't know how you press it. Top comment by Halfwit Wizard, liked by 15 people. A budget... Uh, a budget EV from Tesla would be an obvious home run. Do they really think a driverless Uber alternative or a low-volume roadsters are the right things to focus on? I've been saying it for a while now. Elon, Mr. Truth Seeker, is not above stretching the truth and being misleading. This is a great example. I don't think so. While we argue all day about the word scrapped, canceled, postponed, or put on the back burner, there's certainly more truth than falsehood in that original report. We don't know that yet. You're, that's based on your reporting. Effectively, Tesla is not working on the NV9 project anymore, and it is focused on robotaxi instead. That's the truth, which you wouldn't know if you just read Elon's denial of the report and moved on. Well, that seems to be Elon's goal lately with his constant attacks on the media. They don't get everything right, which is impossible to do. So you focus on what they get wrong to bury what they got right, but you don't want people to know. So here's my current take. This is Randy. I'm now talking, not electric. I've been saying for two weeks now that Elon is, see is seeing, he's probably driving a, a version 12.13 or maybe even a 12.14. Even, even you and I out there, everybody out there, if you're you're either driving a car that's got 12.3.3 or 3.4, uh, you're, you're driving it and you're seeing how amazing it is. Or you're watching the videos and you're seeing people go on hour drives, hour and a half drives with no interventions, not even hitting the accelerator pedal. Moreover, we've had no updates on Optimus for a while. Why do you think that is? Oh, I think they're far along on this too. I think they're way past what we know about right now. We know that they're number two in compute on the planet and number one on vision in and action out, which are both, which is what's needed for both the, the Optimus and for the RoboTaxi. The company, in my opinion, is making a shift. And I'm not the only one saying this today. There's a few others. Uh, 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 that I've heard. You know, Herbert Ong is thinking they're making a shift and Jeff Lutz is thinking they're making a shift. I'm seeing other folks that are saying, yeah, this looks like a shift is taking place. Well, Elon said in one of his posts today, he said, every five years, you need to really review and make strategic adjustments. It may not be a coincidence that Drew and Rohan announced on the same day as the layoffs. We get all the news, whether seen as good or bad, out of the way on a 100% on one day, however the market looks at it. They got it all out of the way today. What am I going to report on tomorrow? It, it, they did it all today. The company is now lean. Now listen to me. The company is now lean and mean and organized to take on the next phase of the company's growth and direction, which is all about what Elon Musk has been saying it's about for a year now. It's about AI and robotics. That's what he's been talking about. So we've started last year to plan for this shift. This has been an ongoing plan to make this shift. Whatever's going to happen, I don't believe, okay, let me just go on from there. That's a big sentence. Write that one down. The company is lean and mean and organized to take on the next phase of the company's growth and direction, which is all about AI and robotics. Since this is at the top of most people's minds, I... I don't think the Generation 3 consumer automobile is scrapped, the one with the steering wheel. But it might not be on the top of the priority pile. Right now, the top of priority is probably Optimus and RoboTaxi for the next 160 days until we get to October 8 and whatever's going to happen right after that. And then will that mean that the, the, the Gen 3 vehicle with a steering wheel is not going to happen in mid-2025? It might be the end of 2025 instead of mid-2025. 
Would that be a huge crisis? Not if RoboTaxi is introduced on October 8 and really is ready to go, and not if Optimus is introduced later this year or in the beginning of 2025 and it's ready to go. Nobody will even care about the Gen 3 vehicle anymore. Write that down. If those two things happen, nobody will care when the, the uh, Gen 3 driving drivable consumer vehicle comes out because it will no longer matter to the Tesla investor. Okay, this is Randy Kirk. <laughs> and yes, uh, Larry and I are having trouble connecting. So that'll be, like I said, Friday, Saturday is when we'll probably have something on with Larry again. Um, tomorrow, uh, we'll have a regular Brian White and then Nicholas Gibbs tomorrow night. Don't forget to check out my Elon Musk X post program that comes out at various times, but usually between 10 and two people are really liking it. It's getting lots of views and, uh, very, very kind comments. Uh, and I'll, uh, leave a post for that. I'll leave a, uh, uh, what do you call it? A card for that in a little while. Also joining Patreon would be a great help right now. Um, you know, it's uh, tax season. You know, that'd be a good reason. It's probably a good reason for you not to do it, right? <laughs> but it's a good reason to help me out. All right, let's move on. Market Watch, the numbers. The New York Fed's Empire State Business Conditions Index, a gauge of manufacturing activity in the state, rose 6.6 .6 points in April to a negative, <laughs> rose 6.6 .6 points to a negative 14.3. The regional bank said Monday. The index had fallen to a negative 20.9 in March from a negative 2.4 in February. It's been negative for months and quarters and quarters. Economists expected a rebound to a negative 10 uh, in April. <laughs> Excuse me. According to a survey by the Wall Street Journal, this was the fifth month of reading below zero, which indicates deteriorating conditions. Key details. The index for new orders rose one point to a negative 16.2 in April. The shipments index fell 7.5 points to a negative 14.4. Okay, so new orders went up a little bit. Shipments fell. Unfilled orders ticked up 0.8 points to a negative 10. Unfilled orders, still negative. Prices paid rose 5 points. That's not good. To 33.7 in, in April. And selling prices came down just a bit. That's not good. That's a squeeze on margins. Anyway, can't find anything good to say about this report, really, except optimism about the outlook for the next six months remains subdued. <laughs> so, no, nothing nothing about this report is good, except that it's a little, maybe a little better than last month. I'm not sure. Big picture, according to uh, MarketWatch, while some of the regional Fed factory readings have been weak, other manufacturing data has be, be, begun to signal some recovery. The ISM factory index rose above 50 in March from the, for the first time in six months. Well, there you go. These guys need to come on. See, there, there's some good news on Good News Monday. This is from Reuters talking about inventories. Inventories increased by 0.4% after being unchanged in January, the Commerce Department Census Bureau said on Monday. The pickup in inventories, a key component of gross domestic product, was in line with economists' expectations. Inventories advanced 1% year-on-year in February. So this was 0 0.4 after a, after a 1.0. So inventories going up is not necessarily a good thing unless you're increasing those inventories because you're expecting greater sales. Increasing inventories is good if you've not had the right balance of inventories. But sometimes inventories going up is a... Is a problem because you're not selling things through. And that is tr absolutely true of automobiles. So let's watch the rest of it. Private inventory investment was cut by 0.47 percentage point from the GDP growth in the fourth quarter. And so this would mean that the inventory growing would increase the uh, GDP in the first quarter, probably. Growth estimates for the first quarter are as high as 2.7% pace. Retail inventories increased by 0.6 in February. And we've now, now, remember, this is old news. This is February reporting. Instead of the 0.5% estimated, um, they rose 0.4% in January. So that's been pretty consistent. Motor vehicle inventories climbed 0.8% in February rather than the 0.9% as previously estimated. They gained 0.8% in January. So those have been going up at a very high clip. Retail inventories, excluding autos, which go into the calculation of GDP, increased by 0.4% as reported last month, 0.3, et cetera. Market Watch Home Builders Confidence Index. 
This is super up-to-date April stats. So much better than looking at February stats. Here we go. There was three gauges that underpin the overall business confidence index, and they were mixed. Builders were upbeat about current sales conditions. There was there people are walking in the door. Okay, that gauge rose one percent. Builders are seeing a steady stream of traffic from prospective buyers. That gauge rose by one percent, one point. But they were downbeat about future sales. That gauge fell by two percent. That's what I said on Sunday night. Last night, I said I thought that the home builder's confidence would be dropping a bit at this point. And then we have this one just breaking before we came on the air. Cobasi letter saying, shocking stat of the day, U.S. CPI inflation is on track to hit 4.8 percent by the 2024 election, according to Bank of America. Over the last three months, CPI inflation has averaged 0.4 on a month-over-month -month basis. That's been consistently for 90 days. If this trend continues, it puts year-over-year -year inflation on a pace to hit 4.8 by November, its highest since April of 2023. This would more than double the Fed's 2%, no kidding, inflation target. Um, inflation has been above the 2% long-term target for 37 straight months. So that would that's a that, that's the number that we'll be arguing about in the morning. We'll be talking about that with Trueflation on that Spaces on X. You want to tune in. That's at 6.30 California time, 9.30 Eastern on Spaces. You can find me over there talking to these folks because their numbers right now, they're sitting at 1.79, 1.79. And as you just heard, we're at 4.8 for the last 90 days. What's the disconnect? What's happening? Who's right? Who's wrong? And can we trust what Trueflation is saying for the purposes of making projections in our businesses, for the purposes of making projections as investors, for the purposes of making projections if we're government agencies, and if Trueflation is better and more, more current and more correct than the, than the CPI information, then why don't we throw out the CPI information and switch over to let the government switch over and use better information. Anyway, it's a, it's right now, the problem is, is that Trueflation can't use their data in order to predict CPI's data. And that's the biggest problem I got. And that's what we'll be starting out with tomorrow, trying to find out what's going on here. Okay, where are the markets now? Let's uh, start as we always do with Mr. Tesla. And of course, you know that Tesla was down uh, uh, big time on the market today, down $9.57. But again, it was not alone in that. Um, it, it's down to 161.48. With the Dow down 248, NASDAQ down 290, and this S&P down 61. Uh, but again, all the Magnificents were down, and all but one of the Kathy Woods was down. And actually, all of them were down. The one that wasn't down was exactly zero. So, okay, so everything was down today. It went further and further down as the day progressed, uh, and there was no even beginning of a hope of a pickup at the end of the day. So, we may be going down further tomorrow. Now Tesla is down another dollar thirteen in the after dollar twelve in the after hours at one sixty thirty six. Okay, let's go take a look at the bonds. We have got the bonds, the ten year. <clears throat> Whoops, hit the wrong thing there. So sorry. Here we go. We've got the bonds. The ten year is uh, down actually one point six in the after hours after being up huge during the day. Uh, that is at 4.612 now, not, not a good number, <clears throat> down point oh, just four tenths of a uh, basis point on the two year. And we have the two month uh, up actually uh, uh, 1.7 basis points. So there's been a little bit of that coming back together there. 4.15 versus 6.12. Uh, you know, that looks wrong to me. What's wrong with that? Four, six, one, five. Anyway, I'm going to have to take another look at that later. That looks like it's 200 basis points. Now, that would make no sense. So maybe they're doing something wrong. The two-year and the two-month, I mean, the 10-year and the two-month are now split. It's almost five. Um, wow. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to give you the numbers here. 4.612 for the 10 year, the two year at 4.932. Okay, that is 30 basis, 30, 32 basis points. That's normal. 
I don't know whether if I was looking at it backwards or something a minute ago, and four, six to five, four. That is under 100 basis points. Okay, and now I got it. It's about 80 basis points. So that has been contracting. And even the 3.2 on the two year is just a little bit uh, less than it's been. It's been more like 3.5 to five. So we're starting to see some contraction of this inversion, whatever that actually turns out to mean. That'll be interesting to watch and see what happens. Okay, we've got oil up another half a buck in the after hours. No activity in uh, with Israel and, and uh, Iran. Um, so, uh, but the Brent is still over $90 and uh, Texas Intermediate 85.83, giving it about a $4 difference, which is where we normally see it uh, when there's a little bit of unrest in the Middle East. So that, I don't know if we can count on that, but that's how I've been looking at it. Natural gas down 0.24, now down to one six eight, $1.68. We have got the, the gold, gold firming again at 2,401, but that's still down about 1% from its all-time high. Silver has been screaming higher. It is now at uh, 29 bucks, up another point another full percentage point uh, in the pre-market. And that is basically double where it was in 2020. So in four, a little over four years, it's doubled. Copper is down a little bit, but still sitting at 437. Uh, the dollar continues to jump. It is, uh, and recognize when the dollar is up and gold is up and oil is up and silver is up and copper is up, that's the opposite of expectations. <laughs> Normally, if the dollar goes up, then it buys more of those things. And so they go down. So the fact that all of those commodities and all of those uh, other elements are up, even, in, even with the dollar being up, is an unusual circumstance. Okay, then we've got the Bitcoin down 732 again, 63,461. 63, um, and then we've got the uh, equities. Everything, this easy enough, it's flat. It's just plain flat. That's all That's all that can be said about that. And back over to Tesla again to see if there's any motion. It's about the same. A buck 15 in the after hours, negative. So we'll see what happens in the morning. We will start our conversation. We'll start our day tomorrow morning at 6.30 my time uh, with Trueflation, having that discussion about what in the heck are they doing and how are they doing it so that we can actually use them to make some good judgments about what we're doing. And then later uh, in the day tomorrow, we'll have Brian. And uh, yes, and then earlier today, as I mentioned, every single day now, sometime between 10 and 2, usually there is the Elon Musk X. I've been thinking about calling it the X files, the Elon Musk X post files, the Elon Musk post facto, the Elon Musk post post toasties anyway i'm not sure but anyway if you haven't watched it yet here's a card which would allow you to go check it out and see whether you like it or not all right um hitting uh the patreon and going down and clicking on that would be good and then you could join up and help support the channel i know it's harder on tax day but you know maybe tomorrow then <laughs> hey listen it's been great talking to you